All right, hello everybody. This is kind of a retraction video from when I last said that SSD caches are really not that helpful for single users. Well, I actually recently found something that I use all the time now, and it is entirely because of Synology's SSD caching. So for those of you who don't know what SSD caching is, it basically takes your most commonly used files and puts them on an SSD instead of the hard drive. Then whenever you're reading files from your Synology NAS, it will first look in the SSD cache to see if they're there. If they're there, they just serve the files directly from the SSD without touching the slower random read and write hard drives. If you ask most people and me last week where this would be most helpful, is definitely only for small businesses where you might have five or six people connecting all at the same time, all trying to download similar files over and over again. Otherwise, for single users, I did not think it would be that big of a deal due to the random read and write only being affected. However, I've started using my Synology NAS as a Final Cut Pro destination, which means I store all my files for Final Cut Pro on the NAS and just access them via my computer. I have the DS1819 Plus with a 10 gigabit card in there, so I'm never throughput limited from my network connection. Final Cut Pro uses storage a little bit differently than other editors do. It does not store things in RAM. It almost always will access things directly from the disk. Final Cut Pro is Mac only, and in general Macs come with very quick SSDs, so you can leverage them to get really fast read and writes from Final Cut Pro. However, when you're using them on a hard drive, it can be very slow because of all the random read and writes anytime you, you're moving your cursor. All right, so to do this, I've got a 10 gigabit connection directly into my computer, and we're going to connect to my Synology NAS using NFS. I've got a tutorial on how to do this, and it allows you to store Final Cut destinations directly on your NAS. All right, so now that we've done this, we're gonna go ahead and open up a one of my archived projects. All right, so let's go in and open up this one. And as you can see, Final Cut Pro has loaded up. Now to make this fair between all the tests, we're first going to go ahead and delete all the generated library files. This way we know that both systems are using the exact same base starting point and there's not anything like optimized media or pre-rendered frames. All right, so now let's just go to the timeline. Here I am. And this, is, this first part of this is mostly going to be kind of a smell test. It's difficult to actually get numbers from this, but I'm gonna go ahead and scroll through the timeline randomly a bunch of times and see how it performs. And as you can see here, it's having a lot of trouble. There's a bunch of drop frames. It is just slowly working. And looking at my network, I'm getting 160 megabytes up. But even then, it's still really slow. This is because of the random read and writes that are being performed right now. All right, so that is more or less simulating what happens when you're actually running a Final Cut Pro project. You're gonna be going through the timeline a bunch of different times. So the first part of our test was just to go ahead and scroll through the timeline as you normally would when editing. And it is incredibly choppy. Even though I have five hard drives in my bay right now, all in RAID 1. This should have a very fast performance. However, the problem with it is when you're scrolling through a timeline, Final Cut keeps trying to grab frames from random parts of the timeline, 
which gives you a ton of random read and write if you're scrolling through a timeline because it keeps trying to grab different frames at different times. This slows mechanical hard drives to a halt. Now, for the second part of our test, we're going to go ahead and first, once again, because it's been pre-rendering, we're going to go into File, and once again, delete the generated library files because Final Cut Pro automatically pre-renders files. All right, so I've got my timer. I'm gonna go ahead and start it as soon as I click Export. And we will be exporting both of these directly to our, my internal hard drive. All right. All right, so I'll go ahead and just stop this recording because, well, it's gonna take a little while. All right, we are finally coming down to the last bit. Boom, it is just finished at 18 minutes and 29 seconds. All right, so now we're going to go back into DSM and we're going to enable an SSD cache. So to do that, we're going to go into Storage Manager, SSD Cache, and create one. I currently have two SSDs available for an SSD cache. However, I'm going to do a read-only cache because I've honestly heard some bad things about read-write caches. I know it's probably a 0.1% chance of an issue happening, but for me, the ability to write in does not help me that much, especially with Final Cut Pro. 95% of what you're going to be doing that's going to be slowing down your hard drives is actually reading the images rather than writing to them because Final Cut Pro only writes when there's changes. Now there are going to be times where it's rendering and writing at the same time, but realistically, the hard part about rendering is not the disk IO, it's the rendering by the CPU and GPU. So I'm going to select both the drives these are Samsung. They're not the best SSDs, honestly. They're kind of cheap. And they're mounted in base one and two for the two and a half inch hard drives. They still get the job done because their read write is substantially better than anything a hard drive RAID could ever do. And we're just gonna go ahead and max it out. All right. While the SSD cache is being built, let's talk about what we expect to see. All right, so I expect to see that our biggest performance boost by far is going to be while scrolling through the timeline in Final Cut Pro. This is because this video has two 4K streams that are embedded in each other, and to render each of those frames takes a lot of just data, and specifically a lot of random read and write data. As you're scrubbing through the timeline, you are randomly grabbing frames each way. That means that this is the perfect situation for an SSD cache, as SSDs are magnitudes and magnitudes faster at random read and writes than hard drives ever could be, due to the fact that hard drives have to physically move a spinning dial to make sure that they can read the random parts of the disk. However, SSDs, reading from any part, is almost just as fast as reading sequentially, because they're just NAND gates moving. As for the full export, I honestly don't know if we'll see any performance boost. During that past export without the SSD cache, I was only getting about 10 megabytes up from my NAS, meaning that it was not being saturated and that was probably just a sequential read, which hard drives can do very well. This is because when you're rendering a video, you render the entire video frame by frame by frame, and you're not jumping around to random parts of the disks hundreds of times a second. You might jump around maybe five times a second to get the next part of the video for cuts and things like that. But by far the biggest performance hit is going to be in the CPU actually rendering the video. All right, so our SSD cache has finally been built. So we're gonna go ahead and configure one specific part about it. And that is we're going to not be skipping the sequential IO. This is because we want to be loading in everything from Final Cut directly into this. That way it'll be as fast as possible. This can overwork your SSDs. 
However, as I said earlier, they're kind of cheap and I don't really care about them too much and I would much rather have the massive performance gains. All right, so now let's remount a Final Cut. We're going to go to the same video. And once again, before testing, we are going to delete all generated files. All right, so now that that's been deleted, we should be starting with a clean slate. So let's check out what the SSD cache looks like right now. So here, it's just about empty. Well, it's actually almost got an entire gig in it. That was quick. And we're going to go ahead and just run through the Final Cut timeline. So right now, it's still pretty choppy. That is because we have yet to load everything into the SSD cache. However, as you see right now, it is actually slowly getting faster and faster and faster. And there's a big performance boost here. This is what I was talking about when I said that there is a good reason to have really fast SSDs for read and write when you're using a NAS like this. This is because there's so much read and writes going on that they can be significantly improved. So now let's go back and see what the read and write cache is. It's already at two gigabytes. And I'm sure if we continue to do this, we will just get faster and faster and faster as it loads more and more parts of this video into the SSD cache. Yeah, it, it is working incredibly fluidly right now. Still not as fast as directly hosted on my Mac. However, it's completely usable. You can go through and you can figure out exactly which frame you'd like to choose from. And there's very little slowdown. And as we go further and further, it'll just get faster and faster. So let's see playback. Playback happens almost instantly. And now, all of those parts are rapidly being added into the NAS. All right, so yeah, right now I'm just going through and I'm kind of doing what you would do normally and scrubbing through the timeline, working through it, uh, watching some of the videos. Realistically, everything's going to be read at least a few times while you're editing this, from optimized media to actually viewing it. You're always going to be reading parts of the videos and so that means that almost instantly, everything will actually just get added into the SSD cache. If you'd like to watch this video, well, actually continuously watch this video and not be cutting around it the entire time, go ahead and click the link right here. Promotion, yeah. All right, so I've done a portion of what I probably would do editing a video in which going through it over and over and over again, where it's for sure all going to be loaded into cache. Instead, I've just kind of been buffering through this part a few times over, but most of it is getting loaded into the cache. First, we're going to see that we've already got about four gigs of video files in the cache. That's about right, considering how I think this is a 20 gig file, and I've really only been going over about a quarter of it a few times just to get it eh, more or less rendered. So now we're going to go and give it the exact same starter and resources right here by going and selecting the project and deleting the render files. This way, we know we're starting from the exact same point both times. All right, so now that those have been deleted, let's go through and just see how it buffers, how it runs. This is running a lot better when you're randomly scrubbing through the timeline. It is significantly flying by. I. It's, it's honestly just so much cleaner, and I've not even gone through all the video in this timeline yet. If we really shake it, it still continues to keep up. So as you can see there, we got a huge performance boost when we were just randomly going through the timeline, and we had so many more frames were rendered per second, and it made it so much more usable. I know it's not a scientific study, but I would say it's probably three to four times as many frames were being rendered at any given time. I'll let you see it on playback here though, side by side. All right, 
And now let's go ahead and do our final test. We're, and that's going to be to export it to the same place. We're going to once again delete generated library files. And we're going to see if there's any difference in the export time. I don't think there will be, but you never know. All right, putting it to the same save location and let's hit start. Forgot to show the sync here. One, two, three. All right, and I'll see you in probably about 20 minutes again. All right, it's coming down to the wire here. Last time Final Cut made a huge jump right at like 5% left, so I'm ready this time. I did get it last time, but I wasn't able to show it on camera. I just like saw it finish and jumped. Um, so yeah, we're, we're at about 17.30 right now. And so let's see who's gonna win the race. Bum, bum, bum. Thrilling, I know. Well, I've been here for 20 minutes. Well, 17 minutes and 40 seconds. <laughs> All right, it looks like the previous test has just about one. We'll see. I'd probably give it like 30 seconds of variance is just about the same, if anything, because realistically, like, there's a lot of random stuff that might be memory and all those kinds of things that are going on with the computer. But anything past 30 seconds, I would call pretty significant. All right. And it just finished. All right. As we can see here, video is through all the way just fine. And at 18 minutes and 56 seconds. So that's about what? 25 seconds longer. Um, what? That's that's actually pretty good. Pretty good measure. All right. So as we can see here, there was only about a two percent difference in the two. So I mean, it is there is a difference for sure, but it's not super significant. I wouldn't say. Um, I would say just about anything under five percent is probably just due to random variation in everything. Um, but we for sure know that the SSD cache should not help and it likely actually possibly could have hurt it in the fact that things have to randomly go through the cache first and if they're not already in there they won't check but realistically this is not a heavy read write operation and I would be willing to bet it focus mostly on something like how hot the computer was it's getting warm in here and other performance things so we'll call that one a wash all right, so I guess in conclusion, I'd say that a SSD cache is really not going to help you for things such as your full on render. But when you're actively going through the timeline, if you're just one person, you can still get a significant performance improvement because of the random read and writes that it takes whenever you're doing something in Final Cut. Another place where I realistically could see it being helpful is if you were to be creating optimized media on the same volume that you've got your media already. This is because if the media is already in your SSD cache, it will be optimizing it and writing to a different drive. One thing that's always tough and brings hard drives to a slow crawl is whenever you're reading and writing to the same drive with different information. It always makes it incredibly small because that spindle head is constantly going back and forth, back and forth and never really gets time to catch up. This is where having something like a read-write SSD cache could really help you in these instances. However, for my needs, that's a very small part of what I actually do in Final Cut, and so I don't need the read-write cache and the risks associated with it. I'm hoping that in DSM-7, a more stable read-write cache, so I'll be able to use it then. All right, thanks everybody for watching. Go ahead, subscribe. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.